So, if UAP has been weaponized, where is it in the military forces of today? Brilliant question. A number of you have asked that. And I think I spoke to somebody who has an answer. Hail, loyal viewers, peace, love, and understand. Actually, maybe death, war, and destruction. So, have UAP actually been weaponized and deployed? Well, the answer is probably, and um, yes. Certainly a lot of money has been spent at actually studying the highly strange to see if it was possible to turn it into a weapon. Why? Because ever since the Manhattan Project that turned a blackboard fantasy equation E equals MC squared into a nuts and bolt bomb... Pandora's box was opened, and physics is the weapon system of today. But please, sir, please, sir, where's the flying saucer on the battlefield? It's there, but you're not seeing it. So as a UAP fanboy, and even more so a fanboy of advanced physics, why aren't we seeing UAP technology in Ukraine, in the Middle East, deployed by enemy states? Meh. One possible answer is they don't want you to see it. They're keeping their powder dry. Remember this little thing. <laughs> The physics of the proximity fuse was so secret that it was not deployed. It was built to destroy itself if it missed the target. No proximity fuse shell was allowed to be used if it could possibly fall into the enemy's hands because it's so secret. One of the major advancements in ordnance to emerge from World War II is the VT, or proximity fuse. A top secret project during the war the details of construction and operation are still a secret. Some of its unique properties, however, may now be described. It is not the sort of fuse that protects the electrical wiring system in your house or factory. This fuse is a weapon of warfare, the type which is required to detonate an artillery shell, a rocket or mortar projectile or an aerial bomb. These deadly missiles consist of a heavy steel casing containing a charge of high explosives such as TNT. Detonation of this charge splits the casing into hundreds of sharp, jagged fragments which are hurled outward at tremendous velocity. It is these fragments which cause damage to any target that lies near the explosion. The charge, however, will not detonate spontaneously, so the projectile must be fitted with a fuse which will initiate the explosive action at the right moment. The simplest form of artillery or bomb fuses explode their carriers after impact with the target. But this method of detonation has been found to be ineffective when firing at enemy soldiers hidden in trenches. Or when airplanes are engaged with heavy anti-aircraft shells or rockets. These targets could be engaged more effectively if the projectile would explode when it came close. If the fuse could know when it was within damaging distance of the target. Such a fuse had been dreamed of for many years. But during World War II, the scientists of the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, the National Bureau of Standards, and more than three score of institutional and industrial laboratories made those dreams a reality. British and Canadian scientists contributed the results of their experimentation through a system of international liaison in which our embassy in London played an important part. The VT fuse was created by cramming a complete radio sending and receiving set into a tiny space in the nose of a shell or bomb. The radio is turned on only after the projectile has started on its last deadly mission. Once in flight, the fuse sends out radio waves, which are its feelers, continually probing the space around the shell in search of a suitable target. 
When the shell passes close to a target, such as an airplane, the radio waves are reflected back to the fuse, where they trigger a firing circuit and explode the projectile. The same system may be applied to targets on the ground. In this case, the earth acts as the reflector, and the projectile is exploded in such a position that the spray of deadly fragments envelops the target. Although experimentation did not begin in this country until late in 1940, an accelerated program of laboratory work and firing tests resulted in the first model being ready for production only 18 months later. This meant that the tiny radio sets and their delicate components had to be made strong enough to operate properly after being fired from a gun. That adequate sources of electrical power had to be developed. That safety devices had to be designed and had to be proven to be truly safe. Although the VT project was sponsored jointly by the Army and the Navy, it was agreed that the protection of our capital ships was of first importance. Therefore, the first model of fuse to be placed in production was designed for naval use. Large quantities of this model were made available to our ships during 1942, and VT brought down its first enemy plane, a Japanese dive bomber, on 5 January 1943. The new fuses were soon supplied to the British Navy as well, and as the quantity aboard Allied ships increased, enemy planes found it more and more difficult to attack our fleets. Japanese officials have frankly stated that it was this increased efficiency of our anti-aircraft fire which forced them to resort to suicide tactics. Such action, however, gained them little, since VT was found to be just as efficient against the kamikaze as against the earlier bombing planes. The use of VT in naval action, however, was only the beginning. The first Navy fuses were still in the production lines when the design of similar models for the Army was begun. The Army fuse, referred to in the European theater as Posit, first saw action in the defense of London against the flying bomb attack of June to August 1944. The VT fuses and American fire control equipment were supplied to both the British and the United States anti-aircraft guns deployed in the operation. VT helped save London. And it is a very real reason why many a London landmark is still standing and why many a London home is still inhabited. Due to security, general use of VT over land did not begin until December 1944, when field howitzers firing VT-fused shells were thrown into the now famous Battle of the Bulge. Barrages of bursting shells such as these took the Germans completely by surprise and annihilated some of von Rundstedt's crack battalions. Allied air forces employed VT-fused bombs to silence enemy anti-aircraft guns during raids over northern Italy, Iwo Jima, and the Japanese home islands. Army fighters and carrier-based naval aircraft fired VT-fused rockets at enemy strong points in direct support of ground operations. And artillerymen pounded German and Japanese ground troops continually with VT barrages. The German soldiers promptly nicknamed it Hellfire, a perfect description of this weapon, this truly great achievement of our scientific and industrial organizations. Then that's what I'm hearing about UAP physics deployed by the military. Let me tell you two anecdotes. Me and a group of men in Afghanistan were surrounded by the enemy. We had no escape. We were doomed. We got on the radio and said, help, can you rescue us? They were told to stand by, but what happened next was extraordinary. What he told me was this. It was as if time stood still. We actually lost time on our watches. 
and all the enemy disappeared. There was no more enemy fire. It was as if they didn't exist anymore. And we exited the battle zone. He told me, I have no idea what was deployed that day, but it was real. It was something to do with time. And here's another report. This time, something that you and I have actually seen that doesn't make any sense. The missiles attacking Israel from Iran never got there. I hear that the US has a physics weapon in Iraq on the border with Iran and another in Jordan, specifically helping Israel. My contact will not tell me what the technology is, but he did say nothing will get past our dome. To me, it sounds like a non-nuclear EMP weapon. So being a meddling science researcher, I put him on the spot and said, well, why aren't we seeing this technology everywhere? And his answer was very interesting. He said, well, it does exist, but it's highly advanced physics and it needs a team to actually deploy it. We can't use it everywhere. It's expensive, it's unstable. And most of all, we need to keep it secret. The reason we used it against Iran's missiles was because it was an extreme scenario and it was a very specific case. To be honest, he said, we were deeply worried that it would give the game away, let the cat out of the bag. It's vital that we keep our powder dry. So, are you in the military? Have you been trained to use advanced physics weapons? Do you know any of their capabilities? I don't know why you would be telling me, but point me in the right direction because it's such a good question. What's been deployed? What's really out there? Without giving up any secrets to national security, it would be fascinating to know the practical applications for this vast amount of money that has been spent on the studying of the highly strange to turn it into a weapon. The truth is out there.